You're watching The Legal Breakdown. So Glenn, we've got some major news here. We finally have a trial date in Trump's first criminal trial in Manhattan on April 15th. So what happens on that day and what's the timeline from there? Yeah, jury selection will start on April 15th. Judge Mershon made that clear. In fact, as Donald Trump's lawyers continued to try to talk him out of it, he cut them off toward the end of the hearing and said, I'll see you on April 15th. So uh, a group of New York residents will be summoned down to the court, um, probably a group of a, of a couple of hundred, I'm guessing, and they will begin the process of jury selection. It usually starts with the prospective jurors filling out a questionnaire to see whether there are any obvious reasons they can't sit fairly and impartially in this case. There are scheduling reasons. For example, somebody is scheduled to have surgery. Somebody is uh, the sole care provider for an elderly parent or a child. Somebody has non-refundable plane tickets out of the area. And those are kind of easy calls for the court to begin to call out the, the people who really are not in a position to sit as a, as a juror in the case. And then you get down to the substantive reasons. You know, does somebody have such strong feelings either for or against Donald Trump, for example, that it's clear that they're just not an appropriate juror to sit in this case? After the, the jury selection forms or questionnaires are filled out, then the court begins to plow through what's called voir dire. Loosely translated, it means to speak the truth. And the jurors will have to answer a series of questions and then a series of follow-up questions from the judge, from the defense attorneys, from the prosecutors to sort of mine them to see whether they can sit fairly and impartially and, uh, and judge Donald Trump, not only Donald Trump fairly, but give the people of New York and by extension the people of the United States a fair trial. So, you know, it's a pretty complicated procedure. It will probably take at least a week or two before they have 12 jurors and however many alternate jurors Judge Mershon orders be selected. In a case like this, you're going to see perhaps as many as six alternate jurors just in case regular jurors begin to fall out during the course of the trial, which particularly in lengthy trials, that's not all that unusual. And after the jury is sworn, then the parties, the prosecution and the defense will go to opening statements. So that brings us to, you said about two weeks, so April 15th to about the end of April. So uh, so we're at May, and so what's the, the timeline from there? Good question. I, I think we're looking at about a four to six week trial. You can never predict the length of a trial. You know, the prosecution has a pretty good idea about how many witnesses they will be calling, but what they can't gauge is how long might the defense attorneys cross-examine each witness. There are times when a defense attorney chooses not to ask a single question on cross-examination, not unusual. There are times when defense attorneys will cross-examine witnesses for hours and hours, sometimes even days, as I have had happen in RICO prosecutions. Um, and then the, the defense is also asked to give the judge an estimate as to how many witnesses they believe they might call in their case once the prosecution rests its case. What I can tell you from experience is the defense attorneys almost always overestimate. Well, Judge, we expect to have as many as 50 witnesses. And yeah. then when push comes to shove, they end up putting on a handful of witnesses, um, if any witnesses at all. Let me tell you, in criminal prosecutions, it is not at all unusual for the defense not to call a single witness. And then what they argue in closing arguments is, well, look, the prosecutors didn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. They have the burden. We don't. We didn't have to call any witnesses because they already failed to carry their burden. So there are always lots of trial tactics that will go on. This trial will be no different. And could could they try to call like, you know, 50, 100, 150 witnesses just for the sole purpose of delaying this thing, of stretching this thing out as long as humanly possible? They can try. But in my experience, if you have a judge who's really on top of his or her case, and Judge Mershon has been on top of his case every step of the way, they'll recognize what the defense is doing. We have had, I have had situations as a prosecutor where defense attorneys would try to call witnesses that literally had no relevant evidence to present to the jury. We would object a couple of questions in. The judge would often require the defense attorney to make a proffer out of the 
hearing of the jury, out of the presence of the jury, and prove or um, inform the court why it is this witness is being called and what relevant admissible evidence does the witness have to offer. And I've had judges um, preclude witnesses, um, not infrequently, when there was some gamesmanship going on. I think you're exactly right. The game that Donald Trump and his lawyers are very likely to try to play is to try to stretch this thing out as long as they can. I don't think Judge Mershon will permit them to do it. Well, that raises the obvious question. Is there any likelihood that they'll be able to delay this thing until after the 2024 election? Not if the trial actually begins on April 15th. There's no way this trial goes for months and months and months and bumps up against the November presidential election. So I think the only thing that would stop this case from not only moving forward, but from being resolved with a jury verdict, you know, probably sometime late spring, early summer, is if somehow Donald Trump can find some issue to appeal such that the appellate court would kind of grind the trial to a halt. Well, that was actually my next question. Is there something that he can do between now and April 15th to actually delay this trial? He can try, he can file frivolous appeals, but as I evaluate the case as it stands presently, I don't see a viable appeal that he could file to try to get the appellate court to intervene and put a stop to the trial proceedings. Let me tell you, a judge selecting a trial date is not an appealable issue. You know, now, let me say, each of the 50 states have different criminal justice systems and different rules of procedure. So, for example, down in Georgia, in the RICO prosecution, you may remember that Judge uh, McAfee not too long ago granted uh, Donald Trump and some of his co-defendants motion to file an extraordinary appeal of McAfee's decision not to kick DA Fawny Willis off the case. That is ordinarily not an issue that could be appealed, but under the unique criminal procedures of Georgia, a judge can grant somebody's right to appeal. But importantly, even in the Georgia case, Judge McAfee said, but recognize the trial or at least the proceedings that are heading toward a trial will continue even while you file this appeal. I don't think Donald Trump attempting to file an appeal of Judge Mershon setting an April 15th trial date is a winning motion. Okay, well, to that exact point, I want to turn your attention toward this clip. If this was a case that could have been brought three and a half years ago, and they decide to wait now, just during the election, so that I won't be able to campaign, I will be appealing this. So to your exact point, you know, Trump is claiming that he's going to try to uh, appeal this decision to just impose an April 15th trial date. So what's your reaction to him claiming out loud that he's going to that he's going to seek to appeal this to delay uh, this trial date? You know, my reaction is that Donald Trump doesn't know the rules of criminal procedure, so he can file an appeal. Nobody can stop him. But I think it will be a frivolous appeal. I think it will be summarily rejected by the appeals court in New York, they won't even deal with it on the substance. They won't engage in an analysis of what Judge Mershon just did. He, you know, took up Donald Trump's issue, which is, look, we've got these documents that were provided to us late by the prosecutors. Now, they ultimately originated in the Department of Justice, the Southern District of New York U.S. Attorney's Office, given to Alvin Bragg and then promptly given to Donald Trump. And Judge Mershon said, that is not a reason to delay this trial. And I don't think the appellate court would even take up the substance of that ruling. They would probably just say, uh, assuming under the unique laws and procedures of New York and the New York court system, this is not an appealable issue and we are rejecting it. Glenn, what are the implications now of Donald Trump quite possibly and quite likely being a convicted felon ahead of the November election? Well, first of all, we need to acknowledge that the Constitution does not prohibit a convicted felon from running for office, running to be president, or even holding the office of the presidency. Feels like our Constitution could use some uh, shoring up, perhaps revisited, revisit some of the provisions someday, because it doesn't seem to make sense to have a convicted felon occupying the Oval Office. So. What will it do to him politically? You can probably better answer that question than I can, Brian. 
Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's the perfect opportunity for people to see who Donald Trump is. I mean, look, we, we, we know by now who he is and what he's done, but I think um, making it clear just by virtue of having a jury actually focus on the set of facts in front of them and make this determination unto themselves, I think it's going to have a really big impact for people who are on the fence who aren't paying attention right now. I mean, we look at all the polls and the people, you know, focused, you know, the, the, the political freaks who are focused on this stuff right now, as we all should be, but the vast majority of this country isn't paying attention right now. And I think when they tune in in August, September, October of this year, ahead of the, the November election, and they see that Donald Trump is now a convicted felon in at least one case with three more cases pending, I think that's going to absolutely have a major impact on their willingness to vote for the guy. I mean, this is somebody who came forward and said, vote for me because I'm, I'm rich and savvy. Uh, we're now finding out that he's very clearly not as rich as he claims to have been. And that's, that's been abundantly clear uh, as far as him having difficulty finding all of that money to pay for those bonds in his, uh, in his civil trials. Um, and in terms, of, in terms of his savvy, I mean, look, he has an entire, an entire raft of businesses that have been nothing but failures, from Trump Wines to Trump Magazine, Trump Casinos, Trump University, Trump Airlines. I mean, the, this guy's entire life has been licensing failure after licensing failure. And then he has the presidency, which ended in two impeachments, four indictments, and 91 criminal charges against him. So any way you cut it, he is not who he claimed to be when he got voters to vote for him uh, in 2016. And I think that's going to be made even more clear now ahead of 2020. Yeah. And I've seen some of the reporting, some of the interviews, even some of the polling that suggests that uh, even traditional Republican voters have said, even though they might have been inclined to vote for Donald Trump, if he is convicted at trial, if he becomes a convicted felon, they said they would walk away from him. So, you know, I, I do think that, you know, it will continue to sort of have support peel away from Donald Trump if he is in fact convicted in this case. And when you look at some of the evidence in this case, like an audio recording of Donald Trump and his then co-conspirator Michael Cohen plotting to engage in these hush money payments. And then you look at some of the hard corroboration, some of the hard supporting evidence like the reimbursement checks that Donald Trump was writing and signing out of the Oval Office after he was elected, reimbursing Michael Cohen for Michael Cohen having paid the hush money himself and then Donald Trump having to reimburse Michael Cohen for those payments and claiming that it was, you know, fees for attorney's services, legal services, hence falsifying documents. I mean, this is really not a difficult case for, for the um, district attorney's office in New York to prove on the merits. So again, I would put my one buck, my betting limit on a New York jury finding Donald Trump guilty as charged. Yeah, I think the facts of this case are very clearly beyond dispute. I think it's going to be difficult for Republican voters out there who profess to be pro-family values to see what happens in this case in terms of Donald Trump paying off a porn star for an affair he had while his wife had just given birth to their son at home uh, and to continue to want to support this guy or for the guy who claims that he's the law and order candidate who's now a convicted felon for those voters out there to look at that and continue to want to support that guy. And I think it's worth noting as one last thing that you know, this may not have some massive impact. I know people on the right are going to look at this case and they're going to scoff at it because it is likely the least important of the four criminal trials that he's contending with. But remember, these elections are won on the margins. Joe Biden beat Donald Trump in Georgia by 12,000 votes. He beat Donald Trump uh, in Wisconsin by 20,000 votes, just a little bit more in Pennsylvania. So this thing is, you know, these elections are, are a game of not miles, but inches. And every little bit that continues to chip away his support, like being a convicted felon, uh, is only going to hurt him. It's not going to help him. So, of course, with that said, Glenn and I will continue to focus on this trial as it continues to play itself out. Uh, for those watching right now, if you want to follow along with this trial, that's going to start on April 15th. Please make sure to subscribe. The links to both of our channels are right here on the screen. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. And I'm Glenn Kirshner. You're watching The Legal Breakdown.